At the end of February, Muqtad al-Sadr extended his Mahdi army ceasefire by another six months. But the cleric vowed to continue fighting the occupation. America knows I will continue fighting its forces. This is legal. It is our right to resist, and no one can deny our right. The Iraqi government does not recognize the right of resistance. Publicly, it called them terrorists. But when it meets the resistance, it says, it is your right to resist. He was not the only one decrying the occupation. On March 2nd, Iranian President Ahmadinejad visited Baghdad, the first by a Middle Eastern head of state since the invasion of 2003. He was welcomed with full red carpet treatment, one that George Bush never got. The image of Iraq's leaders shoulder to shoulder with the Iranian president reignited the divisions within Iraq. Sunnis and some Shias protested in Kirkuk, Diyala and Fallujah, clutching banners denouncing Iranian interference and its support to militias. There is no doubt that Iran benefited the most from the war in Iraq. It's making use of our struggle against the occupation, but we cannot stop fighting the foreign forces who are killing our women and children. The Americans should have thought about this before invading. They should have thought about who is going to win this war in the end. Ahmadinejad rejected Washington's accusation that Iran was fueling the violence, saying that the one nation that interfered in Iraqi affairs was the United States of America. But Iran's real influence was also put to the test. Muqtad al-Sadr's ceasefire unraveled when on March 24th, his followers went to the streets and shut down neighborhoods in West Baghdad, demanding that the government stop targeting al-Sadr supporters. The next day, Iraqi forces launched a military operation in the southern city of Basra, officially stating that it was going after criminal gangs and unruly militias. The government goal was to impose law and to restore security. The operation targeted gangs that controlled the financial revenues of the city. They used to smuggle oil and control the harbors. They were also carrying out assassinations. The operation targeted mainly Mahdi army militiamen and on that same day, Muqtad al-Sadr called on his followers to start a civil disobedience campaign. On March 27th, the fighting had engulfed several cities across the south and reached Sadr city in Baghdad, from where militiamen fired mortars at the Green Zone. On that same day, George Bush gave a speech. He had clearly not been following the news reports. It is a sign that the surge is working and civil society is beginning to grow. It is a sign normalcy is returning back to Iraq. Even as he spoke, Thousands of al-Sadr followers in Baghdad were calling for the overthrow of Prime Minister al-Maliki's Shia-led government. This is one of my biggest problems. Religiously, I'm closer to the Shias, of course. But politically, I agree with the Sunnis. The six-day-long clashes became a turf war between rival Shia militias vying for influence in the oil-rich south ahead of the provincial elections next October the Mahdi army on one side and the bad organization which controlled the security forces on the other side. There are parties who are trying to stop the provincial elections. This has created problems in Basra, Diwaniya and other parts of the south. So I can say there is no security and we cannot do elections. I also believe that you cannot have elections while the country is under occupation. There is competition, but this image is exaggerated. It's true that some of the bad people had infiltrated the police forces, but this does not mean that we attack them with no reason. The Mahdi army are armed groups and say they target the occupation, but they use weapons against other parties as well. In many cases, they use civilian areas to shell from. The Battle of Basra was the first military offensive carried out by the Iraqi army since the invasion of 2003. They couldn't repel enemy firepower, so US and British Air Force and artillery were called in support, raising once again concerns about the abilities and loyalties of the security forces. More than a thousand had deserted. The clashes threatened to snowball into a full-blown inter-Shia war from Basra to Baghdad. It's only through Tehran's intervention that the battle ended. 
General Qasem Soleimani, a man on the U.S. terrorist watch list, successfully mediated between the rival factions. The guns were silenced just a week ahead of General Petraeus and Ambassador Crocker's second status report to Congress. Perhaps recognizing the fragile situation on the ground, General Petraeus recommended a freeze in troop withdrawals after all surge troops pull out next July 2008. There should be a period of consolidation, of evaluation and assessment, uh, something I think is, is eminently successful when you've done such a substantial uh, reduction uh, to just see how, how the situation is, to, to take a hard look at it, to perhaps do some adjustment of your forces and their locations and so forth, and then to continue. Petraeus's testimony in the midst of the presidential campaign brought the Iraq debate to the forefront in Washington. The U.S. presence in Iraq is at the heart of the elections campaign, with each candidate offering a different scenario for pulling out troops. But the reality is that only events on the ground will dictate U.S. policy and not election promises. Still, the future change of guard in the U.S. has created an atmosphere of uncertainty among Iraq's leaders. We're there holding up security, holding up the floor of security in the country, while they are able to exercise power and, frankly, uh, have access to a lot of the oil wealth of the country, to put it as politely as possible, not all of which is being used for the public interest. We're there facilitating that. And um, if they think we're going to be there indefinitely facilitating that, what is their uh, incentive to compromise? On the other hand, if they think that a Democratic candidate might be elected President of the United States and simply withdraw all American troops in a matter of months, what's their incentive to compromise? And ahead of the U.S. elections, the Iraqi government is going after all its enemies. On May 14th, the Mosul offensive against al-Qaeda announced by the Prime Minister at the beginning of the year finally began. But those who know Iraq well fear it's just another episode in the cat and mouse game between al-Qaeda and U.S. and Iraqi forces. The fighters are not dumb to be sitting there waiting for the attack. They have been announcing it for months, so the fighters left, and those who will suffer the consequences are the local people. They always give warnings and the fighters just leave. They will go back to al or somewhere else. They will go underground and pop up again at the right time. There hasn't been a comprehensive plan. Ever since the war started, we are patching up mistakes. The surge hasn't managed to foster any real unity among Iraq's factions. Old wounds continue to fester beneath the surface. You know, sometimes I'm a doctor. You give a patient uh, a tranquilizer, a palliative treatment, a painkiller to alleviate the symptoms, but you are not treating the, the problem. Then as a doctor, after you finish this, you go into dealing with the problem. But what we are doing is just giving uh, tranquilizers and painkillers all the time. And this is not going to last forever. You know, there are lots of theories. We hear a theory of dividing the country into three confederations. And the most important benchmark and the only one that is worthwhile focusing on is reconciliation. The surge is going to have to wind down. If we don't take this moment to fill that political gap and broker this political bargain, this constitutional compromise that would give all the different parties a confidence in the future, I think we may look back at this moment as a kind of window of opportunity that was there, that was not exploited, and then gradually shut. The big test for Baghdad is yet to come, once all the checkpoints, blast walls, and security forces are lifted from the streets. Only then we will know whether it can return to be the ethnically mixed capital it once used to be. Many feel it will take generations for Iraqis to forgive and forget. People of my age have always mixed with Shias. We know them well and we have no problems. But I feel for the young generation on both sides, those below 25, they haven't had a chance to know each other. 
They have lived with sectarianism since an early age. They are surprised when the elders still speak to each other. The young are sectarian. After spending more than three trillion dollars, the U.S. is not going to completely leave Iraq anytime soon. We have a long-term strategic commitment to Iraq because we have a long-term set of interests in Iraq and in the region. Now, this year, 2008, we will be negotiating with the government of Iraq a long-term security framework agreement that will replace, by the end of this year, the Chapter 7 mandate under which the multinational force Iraq has operated uh, since its inception. Now, that will be a negotiation which will produce a true partnership, sovereign state to sovereign state, government to government, that will define the presence of the U.S. But most Iraqis don't want to see any long-term U.S. presence. They long for the chance to regain complete control of their country. They freed us from Saddam Hussein. What they gave you afterwards, is that better? It's not the matter of better or worse. This is uh, our life. It's now our turn as a people of Iraq and our government to build a new life, a new regime. Iraqi's dreams seem still far away. The occupation of Iraq has destroyed one of the most ancient civilizations in the world. The threat of death has kept journalists and independent observers off the streets. It's only when all the wars within Iraq end that the world will finally know the true extent of the horrors that destroyed Iraq for generations to come.